do you ever have the sense that God is nearby? That I mean, like he's just right there with you in any kind of personal or tangible way? Even though we have three very different stories this morning, the story of Elijah and the widow, the story of Paul and Galatia describing his own call, and the story of Jesus raising the dead widow's son in the town of Nain. The thing that each of those stories tie together, where they tie together, their place in common is the sense of he's around and God is not just present. He's actually taking the initiative. Whether you know it or not, whether you feel it or not, the scripture is declaring this morning, God is stepping in. God is doing something. He's taking the initiative in life. It's important to remember because there are plenty of people who have a very different perception of God than that kind of imminent active presence. They more have this sense of that God is someplace else, wherever else is. And that I don't really think about it very much unless, of course, I get in trouble. And then if I get in trouble, I may cry out to God and ask him to help me. And my hope is, is that somehow if, if I'm good enough, that God will actually pay attention to my prayer in the midst of probably the millions of other prayers that are spoken to him at any point in time. And that he'll kind of lean over heaven's edge and sort of, oh, so-and-so is trying to get in touch with me. And, you know, she's been pretty good, so maybe I'll act in her life. And that God somehow reaches down in some mysterious way and actually changes my circumstances or does something in response to my prayer. But then you see, if I'm, if I'm not so good, then maybe what God will do at that point and say, sorry, better luck next time. I want you to know that that is an entirely unbiblical view of God. I mean entirely, in every single point God is never just sort of sitting up in heaven watching, Scripture says. God never responds to prayer or not, depending on your particular behavior in the moment. I mean, quite honestly, if that were true, we'd all be sunk, right? Come on, nod your head. Yes, we would. <laughs> that, that God's action in our life really is not predicated on how good we've been. He is not Santa Claus in the sky, making a list and checking it twice. And thirdly, God is not just sort of up there waiting for us to say something to him. He is actually active and at work. And in fact, the point of the lessons this morning is that God is stepping in and doing things quite beyond anything anybody ever says to him. Point one, Elijah. What's Elijah doing? We don't know. But where the lesson starts is the word of the Lord came to Elijah. In other words, Elijah took, I mean, God took the initiative. He saw what was happening with this widow. What's the story on the widow? It's just she, she and her son. In other words, and especially in that culture, there's no social, social safety net. There's a bad famine. All she's got is what she's stored up. And it's almost gone. All she has is, as she says, a little bit of oil, a little bit of flour. And what's she going to do? She's gathering some sticks to build a fire. She's going to make what you and I would think of as pita bread. And then she was going to give that to her and to her son. And that was their last meal. They were going to die a horrible death of starvation. That's what she knew was facing her. Nobody else had anything. And she had, at that point, run out. God sees what's happening to that widow, speaks to Elijah, and says, in essence, on my behalf, go intervene. And that's exactly what happens. The story is, God is taking the initiative. He's seeing what's happening with the widow, and he sends the prophet Elijah. And God uses the prophet Elijah as an instrument. Second story, the story in Galatians. Paul is, at this point, the back story is, Paul's in trouble with the Galatians. They're not sure whether they want to follow him as their apostle or not. And so what Paul does in this early part of the letter is he, in essence, explains his credentials. And his credentials are not necessarily his degrees or his family background, although he talks about that in another epistle. 
Instead, he tells the story about how, again, God took the initiative and, in fact, organized circumstances in such a way that literally before Paul was ever born, God brings and sets into motion forces that would give Paul all that he needed so that when God breaks in, again, entirely unbidden, Remember, do you know the story, Paul on the road to Damascus? He was going to go stone Christians. And God just breaks in, strikes him blind, brings him to his knees, and then sends another instrument, in this case a man named Ananias, who prays for it. He is physically healed of his blindness, and God calls him into ministry. Paul is real clear. Sinner of whom I am chief, he says. God breaks in. God took the initiative in Paul's life. Same third story, the story of the widow. It's this. Just like the story of the widow in Elijah's story that we read in the book of Kings, there's no social safety net. She's a widow, so she has lost her source of support in her husband's work. So she at this point is relying on the income that her son brings in to support her. But what happens? Her son dies, tragically, before his time. And so the town feels empathy for this woman, and literally there is a funeral procession beyond the borders of the town called Nain, out into where the cemetery is. And in hot Palestinian climate, with no undertakers, the burial happens the same day. As soon as the person has died, the notice goes out in the village, and they all process out to bury the body. And that's what's happening. Now, Jesus comes up, and they have no idea who he is. And so when he says to the widow, don't cry, she doesn't respond, the scripture records, but of course you can imagine what's going on in her head. Who is he? Why is he telling me not to cry? I, know now, I now have no income whatsoever. I've lost my companions, first my husband, and now my son. I have no family anymore. I have no relatives. I have no support. I have no idea what I'm going to do. Is God after me? <clears throat> Isn't that true that when things begin to go badly for you, one of the things that comes up is, what have I done? And you see, that's very much a part of what's going on in this widow. And so she doesn't say a word. <laughs> she has no idea who this man is. And then he does what, according to Jewish ritual law, was unthinkable. He literally stands in front of the funeral procession at the buyer and puts his hand on the buyer that's holding the body. And everybody, I am sure, went, oh. and the reason is, is because dead bodies were considered ritually unclean. You don't do that. So it's like, what is he going to do now? Everything comes to a dead halt. And of course, what Jesus does is he speaks to the dead body. Young man, I say to you, get up. And the man immediately sits up, and Luke the physician wants us to know this really was a resuscitation from the dead. And so it's, he records the incident that not only does the man sit up, but he begins talking. In other words, he really is alive. And of course, they're beside themselves. And they say what they would say, because they don't know he's the Messiah. A great prophet has arisen in our midst. Again, Jesus intervenes. He steps in to our knowledge. There's no one expecting him to show up, asking for help in any way. He sees the need, steps in, and meets the need. That's the testimony of each of these scriptures, that God takes the initiative. My question for you is, do you believe that God is taking the initiative in your life? Or are you like the people that I described earlier, who sort of believe that God is somewhere out there, and that he really isn't interested in the details of your life? Besides, he knows all of my secrets anyway, right? Which means I'm probably disqualified from any kind of serious intervention on God's part at all, because I have history. You know what I mean? We all have history, though, right? If, if we really actually somehow knew that the secrets of our hearts were laid bare, we'd want to go run and hide. 
And if you actually don't think that, then you don't know yourself very well. But the glory of it is, the glory of it, is that whether we see it or not, God is active in taking initiative in our lives, regardless of the state of our hearts. That's how much He passionately loves us. How much He so deeply cares for us. You and I can be so preoccupied. We're thinking about our list or what's going on on our smartphone or what we're watching on television. The things we have to do or obligations for the day. Going around in our cars, doing whatever we need to do, talking on the phone. And most of us are completely oblivious. Oblivious of God's presence. His active presence in our lives at all. One of the most courageous things that you can pray is, Open my eyes, O Lord. Help me see your hand at work. <clears throat> because if that's really what you're asking, he will begin to open your eyes. He whispers, he rarely shouts, but he shouts if he wants to. And calls us into, in fact, a life that is marked by his companionship. Not his distance, but his companionship. And more wonderful than that, just as he sent Elijah, Paul, and Jesus, he takes those who have become aware of his companionship and he opens our eyes not only to his presence, but what he would like to do with us and through us. In many ways, that's the meaning of confirmation. What people are saying, and listen when we go through the prayers, is that they're saying, I know that God is active in my life. I'm willing for him to use me. So, here I am. And all the prayers that I will pray over each of these confirmands is for God's empowering presence for them to do the work that God has given them to do. I don't know whether you heard that when you were confirmed or not. But the fact of the matter is, that's the real meaning of confirmation. It is a commissioning. And the testimony of the scripture this morning is that God is active. He is at work in your life. Open my eyes, O Lord, that I may see your hand at work in my life. Help me, O God, to be less preoccupied with my television set the things that are going on, the phone calls that I have to make, the messages that I'm getting on my email. Attune me to your presence and what it is that you want to do in my life. Because I believe with all of my heart that if we're willing, and it takes courage to ask this because you never know what you're going to see. If you're willing to say to God, open my eyes, help me see what you are doing, he, in fact, will do that. And then you will, you will be faced with a choice. And the choice is, okay, he's opening my eyes. A am I willing to be a part of what he's doing or not? But he is taking the initiative. When I was at my parish in New York City, there was a man who had just started coming to the church. He had not been a Christian, had not been raised in a Christian family. And he came to Christ through one of the programs that we had. And he started coming to our church services. His name was Pablo, but he wasn't a Latin American. He was Asian. Only in New York do you get these sort of mashups. Raised in Panama, now living in New York City. Pablo had deep scars all around his neck. And the reason was, was that he had, throat, he had throat cancer. And the cancer had destroyed the hearing in his right ear. And you could tell you didn't even need to know that because when he talked, if you've ever talked with someone who was partially mute or is mute, their, their, their um, pronunciation is not very distinct. It's muffled because they can't see, hear themselves very well. And that's how Pablo talked. Well, he was very reserved, as some Asians can be. And after one of the services, I walked over to him, because he'd only been in church a few weeks, had come really through Alpha. And I walked up to Pablo and I said, how are you, how are you, Pablo? 
And he said, just like this, so unlike him. He said, I can hear. And I said, well, tell me what happened. I was stunned. And he said, right in the middle of the service. I mean, nobody had prayed for him. Nobody had laid hands on him. But the hearing in his ear that had been entirely destroyed by cancer. The doctor said, you will have no more hearing in that ear. It opened up. And I said, and he, said, and he told me the story. And I said, Pablo, go see a doctor, get it confirmed, and would you be willing to share it in church the following Sunday? He said, oh, yes. And the miracle was, not only did God restore his hearing, he'd been separated from his wife. He brought his little girl with him, who's like four years old. And so she was coming with him to church. And she'd never been to church before either, which meant she didn't know how to act in church at all. But, you know, it was okay. They were new and we loved them. And eventually he was reconciled to his wife. And he and his wife and his four-year-old daughter became a very active part of our congregation's community. God's hand is at work, sometimes in very clear, miraculous ways, sometimes in ways that we don't even see at all. Are you willing to be a part of what it is that God is doing? If you want to be content with TV, news, your email, the things that are going on in your life, your lists and your friends, your job, you can in fact do that. You don't need to pay attention. And you can wind up doing some good things in your life. But that's not what it means to be a Christian. What it means to be a Christian is to be someone who is available for God to use who is praying, open my eyes to see your hand at work. Help me be a part of what it is that you are doing. In other words, to be a Christian is not to live a self-focused life. It's to live a God-focused life and to be available for Him. That's the meaning of baptism. That's the meaning of confirmation. That's why I said to them, when we were meeting before the service, I said, I want to thank you for what you're doing. It's courageous. And it is. So today, we have a lot to celebrate. And what's going on in the lives of these people who are being presented, thanking God for what it is that God is doing. But also, as we enter into this, the challenge is that we're making commitments too. And I'm trying to lay out for you the nature of the commitment. Are you willing to move from a self-focused life to a God-focused life. And that wherever you are in that transitional journey, being able to say, okay, God, I'm willing to take another step. Open my eyes to see what you are doing. Help me be a part of what it is that you are doing in the world. If so, this liturgy will be a tremendous celebration. If not, it'll still look good, but you'll be a bystander, even if you say the words. So please, I invite you, move from being a bystander to being a participant. As we join them in the commitment they are making to Christ. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, thank you that you did not ignore the cry of our hearts, but that you broke in and that in baptism and Eucharist and confirmation, in so many ways, you continue to give us the promise of your sustaining presence, saying in so many ways, I will never leave you or forsake you. Help us, O oh God, by your grace, to turn from the many preoccupations that demand our time, that in the midst of our responsibilities, we might be your servant, available for you, open our eyes to what it is that you are doing. And may we be a part of it. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen.